Is there a, is there a question from the audience? Yes? Alain? Hi. Um, I've been incredibly impressed um, by all your presentation this morning. Um, I am coming from the kind of other side or another element of that, what you describe is that um, I've been collecting digital art for the last 10 years or so. And I'm quite um, depressed in the way I'm pre I've been preserving my, my works right now, uh, seeing what you've done. Um, so my question will be, in, uh, do you think, uh, how, how are your relationship towards the, um, I would call it the art market, which is not a dirty word because the art market is the, the, the source of, of, of finance for a lot of the creation at one point. So it's the interest of everyone that it's functioning properly. So um, uh, how, what are the relationship, because you have such a, a deep knowledge that you could uh, kind of create some sort, sort of standards. I mean, um, Lima was mentioning that you, it's kind of um, a quality control um, that could be done in advance, a quality norm that could, could be established. So would, are you already maybe thinking or being involved in kind of um, element of s standards? Not, not standards, but anyway, quality controls of the, the steps that should be taken maybe by the artist and, and the, then by their galleries or any representative to, to present the work in a proper way which will, will make it easier to preserve it for the, for the future. Um, okay. Uh, it is it is very um, difficult from a computer science point of view to fully understand any type of software or what it does under any kind of circumstances. So, um, but maybe this is something that that Klaus Rechert will will talk later about it more. If you evaluate a, a performance you kind of need a, a performance you can compare it to, or you kind of say, you kind of need to say, this is kind of the performance I want to see in the future. Uh, but you will have to, these this systems that can actually do performance comparisons, they still need to be developed. But this is, this is something that's kind of happening and possible. But it's, yeah. No, digital art, but everything, Digital art is always about a performance. So if you even, even if you have a, I don't know, a JPEG picture, that's it's not a picture. It's just some completely ununderstandable electrical currents on some medium. So you need a very complicated process to make it back into an image. And these and these the conservation of these processes is a, yeah, is the next thing that needs to be happening. It's just that, um, yeah. It's 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 still at an early stage after all these years, which is yeah, but it's coming along. It's far from a standard, I would say. Are you familiar with the Matters and Media Art resources? Matters and Media Art. So the Tate SF MoMA and the MoMA uh, have, for almost a decade now, been in collaboration to create not standards, but recommendations for best practices in just how you can acquire time-based media art and digital art, how you can loan time-based media art and digital art. And we're currently working on a phase of recommendations that are more centered around the kind of repository type things that we were talking about today and like digital preservation aspects. And this is all online. So if you just Google matters in media art, um, you'll find the resources and it includes templates that will kind of guide you through the acquisition process. Um, but practically speaking, I think that, um, you know, this is, and this is something I think my colleagues are probably growing tired of hearing me saying because I've been really harping on it for the last few months, but I think that there need to be new business models that will emerge for collectors so that they can, um, you know, similar to what Gabby does, you know, at Lima, where the same way that you can, you can hire somebody to store your paintings and your sculpture, like there are art storage facilities that provide that as a service where you can rent by the square footage. 
and you get art handlers, you get preparators, they'll handle building your crates and things like that. But that doesn't really exist other than Lima um, for digital art, you know, because I think to say to think that the collector themselves are going to be the ones engaging with these interviews with the artists is you know it's crazy to think that yeah i think we're in agreement there so but in the us there really you know there are i like two or three private practice conservators that are doing time based media art but even then you know they're not offering the full suite of services so i think that there actually does need to be somebody in the us who's doing this as a a service Um, the uh, um, formulas and uh, the guidelines we use, of course, are based on the the, um, the sources uh, Ben mentioned. But I also want to highlight uh, the word of performance, um, especially speaking about net art. Um, we make contracts for sustaining the work for five years and not longer. And when it's really, really um, networked, using a lot of links and uh, other material, then we say we rather look at it as a performance and make uh, in-depth documentation. To open up the discussion, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was gonna mention Madison Media Art too, but Ben's done that. Um, but I think that is really important because obviously the Tate's collection is only a very small portion of the digital art world. Um, and so it's really important that, that we can reach out to um, artists themselves as well and, and how they should be managing their work so that when they are acquired by another institution then they're able to preserve them. Um, and I think for um, archives too, that's that's really important um, because that's really moving from where you know it it would it would be at the end of an artist's life, say that their papers would be transferred to a collection, um, whereas now it really needs to be more a, an active in, in, interaction with with the archive during the artist's life to ensure that they are managing their records. Actively. Don't know if you have anything to. <laughs> Another question. Okay. Um, I'm the head of the film archive in Berlin, and I. This is the stuff that's on plastic. It's like half a mile per can, and uh, then comes the next can. You remember. Uh, I came here to have my thoughts refreshed because that stuff is over and we all move into the same realm where you already are since a decade or one and a half decades dealing with some form of data. I thank you for these fantastic presentations this morning so the refreshment is working. Um, we need, I have a question to MoMA because MoMA is a media art museum since about 1934. At that time, media art was called film. And you mentioned that you use the Hamlin facility as your last resort of storage, sort of, in this tier that you have for storing stuff. Is there any other connection of what you are doing to what the film archive, I think, should be doing? The film collection at MoMA? Yes. Well, the film collection at MoMA is just part of the broader collection. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are two facets of uh, elements of their collection that we handle in media conservation. They are different in the sense that they actually have their own film conservator with, embedded within the curatorial department. And this really is just due to the... Um, it, it, the history, which it sounds like you're familiar with in terms of the early foundation of the film department um, and the circulating collection. And in fact, a lot of people don't know this, but MoMA was the first cultural heritage institution in the US to collect film. Um, but in any case, so uh, the restoration process is now digital. So um, we are ingesting the, um, the scans of the film and then the resultant 
restored scans. Uh, we're currently scanning all of Andy Warhol's 16 millimeter film in collaboration with the Warhol Museum, the Warhol Foundation, and Motion Picture Corporation. So we're ingesting all of that. Um, but then there's also born digital film. Um, so we're helping the department to understand really what they need to be acquiring. Um, you know, that they can't just acquire, they can't just store the, um, the digital cinema package that they use to show in the theater. That's not a master quality. Um, so it's, it's completely integrated. It's all part of the same program of preservation. Well, I, I have a question um, uh, also for MoMA. Um, your, your main uh, digital storage system is based on uh, Archivum. It's uh, uh, made by a, a, a private company. Uh, of course, I have nothing against that. But how do you deal with that for the, the long-term uh, life of, of this uh, software? What happens? Do you make any long contract uh, for the long-term preservation of uh, these uh, really important tools? If, for instance, they got into brand or, or they are bought by someone else, how do you deal with that? So um, if Archivum went out of business tomorrow, we would have the rights to continue operating our system. It would just no longer be managed but that wouldn't mean that it would stop working. It would just mean we'd have to take on some responsibilities. Um, I mean, at its core, it's all based on an open stack. It's, so it's just LTO, you know, versus, uh, you know, enterprise tape formats made by Oracle, for instance, which are not open, which means that, you know, if we decided to stop using Archivum, we could, in theory, um, you know, you could pull one of those tapes out of the library and just put it in a desktop LTO drive and read the files. Um, and also, Archivum, they've really put a lot of thought and care into just that question. Uh, they typically offer their services uh, as a cloud service, and part of their contract design for when it is a cloud service is escrow. So every um, asset you store is also stored uh, in an offline type tape that's held by a third party so that if they do go out of business uh, and they lose all of your data, there's a copy held by this third party. Um, so it, it's essentially similar to how we have this third copy in our own offsite facility, but when you store things in their cloud, you also get that. So um, there's really, no lock-in, uh, you know, and the hardware that we're using is not Archivum designed, it's, it's just IBM and Dell stuff, you know, they just use whatever is the currently, what they consider to be the best hardware on the market. Um, so it, yeah, it's all in the contract. <laughs> Hey, Dragon. When dealing with uh, emulation as a as a service, how do you handle? I mean, how is going to be handled things like obsolete uh, plugins? Or I mean, you must encounter that a lot with Rhizome people who have used things like QuickTime VR or whatever, and that just doesn't exist really anymore. As some, is it, it? Does this emulator uh, have all possible cocktails of of what's necessary installed or what? I mean. Or is it just that certain things become unreadable after a while, even under emulation? Um, these, uh, what is important to understand about this emulation framework is that you can, you start out with a, probably a basic install of the operating system, and then you can create derivatives on top of that that have all kinds, that can have all kinds of different setups. But it is absolutely true that you need to start collecting software uh, alongside the the things you want to run in the emulator, um, and this this is still around. This is kind of an archaeological task sometimes to find the right version of QuickTime VR, or uh, but it's it's around. Um, there are also there's this great shareware collection, uh, shareware CDs or covered discs that, for example, the Internet Archive holds has lots of the latest plugins of 1999 or something. Um, yeah, but you need to have them and you need to understand what 
each plugin is capable of, so you can combine it with the right artifact that needs it. But once you have one configuration that, that works for one type of artifact, it will work for the whole class of, I mean, it will work for the whole class of artifacts that need Java plus QuickTime VR. How about licensing? What? Licensing. Oh, the law. Well, I think we're running out of time here, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the, the, it is like this that um, an institution like Rhizome, which is very much embedded into the art world and has lots of friends in the art world, um, we can allow ourselves certain things. Also, because we're not that big, we are just the right size. And so we don't ask for permission to use, uh, to put this Macintosh online or to put a Windows 98 online. And if we don't ask, if we don't officially notify the rights holders, they are not required to forbid it. So while I'm sure that they know they have been tolerating it, and um, the, it, it would be a pity because lots of institutions shy away from this topic completely because of the unsolvable legal issues, but this has to be a joint effort of lots of institutions to, to band together and, for example, say to Apple, you have actually a responsibility. You were selling this stuff to artists. You were marketing your stuff to artists. It was the artist's computer, and now nothing works anymore, and the artists are bankrupt because of you. And, <laughs> and they... <laughs> yeah, so they have this responsibility, and they have been... Uh, also perpetuating this idea of ephemerality and of forces of nature, that, uh, that there's a technological progress that just destroys things on the way, like wind and water, destroys buildings, but this is all just them making money. So, yeah, this has to change. Yeah, I, I think that what the Internet Archive is doing in this area is a great example. Um, you know, they don't care and they're not scared of lawsuits, and nothing's happened. You know, they have to take stuff down sometimes, and they do it. And, you know, not every institution obviously is willing to take that risk, so there does have to be some more comprehensive effort, like Dragan was saying, and I think that um, we might see some interesting developments in the coming years because the Librarian of Congress has recently um, changed, you know? So th this is something, there was a meeting at the Library of Congress like two years ago about software preservation and like one of the biggest takeaways from the meeting was that there needs to be like some kind of like federal level, like national like statement to corporate America and also just to, you know, uh, lawmakers that copyright law has to change. Uh, so with this new leadership in the Library of Congress, we might see something like that. But that's probably optimistic. Uh, you just mentioned uh, Apple and, um, and uh, licensing problems. There seemed to be a recent tendency, for, especially from Apple, of like controlling the way you install apps. So you have to go through the App Store. They kind of force you to update to the latest iOS or, or, or on any device. Uh, I'm wondering if in 10 years from now, when iPads won't be around anymore, if the, like, the emulation and, and, and like, um, the way we, we can run old systems, do you think this tendency that Apple has to force you to update or to kind of control the way you install stuff, is there going to be a, a huge impact on uh, how we preserve um, today's um, digital art, I guess? Uh, yeah, definitely, especially with, with updating models like Apple's. Um, there is still a loophole because if they release a new operating system and you are part of the developer program, you get the Golden Master DVD. And so we, at the moment, will be relying on, on leakers that are part of the Apple developer pro program. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's still just a, a, a bad choice, not only for art conservation to, to rely on these systems and have these legal problems. I mean, with, with Android, for example, it's kind of possible to, to run it in emulation. But yeah, if, you're, if, you're, if you know Apple developers, just get a copy from them. <laughs> this needs to be done until this is sorted out. Can I? 
Can I ask the question? Uh, it's also, I was thinking now because um, Ore Harvey and Michael Summon, the artists uh, yeah, <laughs> are here, and uh, it reminded me about a case that can be interesting. I would be inter uh, interested now in your opinion what to do in such cases. Like if I think, recall your work, uh, Eden Garden, that was made around 99. And it was uh, uh, made, maybe not many people remember it now, because it was made for the plugin that existed for half a year, maybe, and then vanished. <laughs> I, I can't remember now the name of it. Uh, what was it? <laughs> yeah, it was not very mal. It was some obscure um, 3D uh, something. Maybe you remember what was this, not? Yeah, this is exactly a situation. Nobody remembers what it was, it does not exist, uh, it's uh, probably not possible to get, but it was the incredibly beautiful, important work, I all the time want to show it to the students. So what should we, should we, could we make in this case? <laughs> um, you should search this plugin. <laughs> And, uh, but if you're, if you're an artist producing things, just don't throw away your old computers. Um, the hard disks are kind of um, it was a problem durable. That, and actually, that was the reason I asked about licensing. Mm. In this case, this plugin stopped working when the company that made the plugin didn't allow it anymore. Mm. SF Omar, who commissioned this piece, paid for it for a year, and then it was over. Yeah, so in that case, you have to simulate a licensing server or whatever is as required. Um, this is this is all possible because, um, for example, when we are working with um, with net art pieces that rely on Google Maps, we can also just copy large parts of Google Maps. We, we can copy the behavior of how Google Maps works or how Nokia Maps works, which is the case now that will be closing very soon. Um, uh, and this can also be done with licensing servers. It's just a, a very laborious process because it's not a standard. Uh, a standard setup that everyone has used at that time. But I'm also thinking if I can uh, continue to talk about about another solution, possible solution, that uh, uh, what we have about it, we have uh, memories of some people about this work. We probably have st still have your code uh, and the concept of this. Can it be remade in some other 3D environment? Isn't it the work of uh, digital restorators to go into such uh, field and to, to not to reinterpret but to recreate the work for the new yeah this is this is the this is a this is a possibility which is incredibly expensive and laborious and finding the plugin and simulating the license server will be easier actually can i add something to yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Um, of course, there are many approaches how, how to deal with it, but there is also uh, are many new ways how to document the works. Um, for instance, the 1st of October, there was a performance by Jody at the Stedelijk Museum. And then there were several, uh, basically, students from different directions, so art, stu art school students, but also archival students and conservation students that all documented the work, and uh, it will be online soon. And for instance, we are also looking to uh, feedback on, on that approach. Uh, it's just to highlight that uh, documentation is so, yeah, extremely important. It's silly to say, but it is. Uh, I think Gabby mentioned something about that, uh, you know, there's some uh, works that call on web, web resources which uh, may or may not exist anymore, which may have moved. Uh, is there any, like, plan to, like, uh, um, connect things to, like, uh, to archive.org resources or something, try to find those things back again? Yeah, um, there's the... <laughs> There's the Memento protocol, yeah. which is a, um, a, uni, a unifying protocol over different kinds of web archives. Of course, the Internet Archive has the biggest, uh, the, the biggest whoop behind the Memento plug. But, um, for example, the Web Recorder software is also supporting Memento. Um, so you can, 
you can say I won Yahoo, the Yahoo front page from the year 1996, and if one archive doesn't have the complete copy, it will cobble it together from different archives, so that, that works. It's just more difficult with, for example, Google Maps or I don't know what was very popular with artists or stock market tickers or weather data or whatever, uh, data stream. Um, but then, then a, a good approach would be just to have a, to have a sample of the data around to, to feed back into the system. Because, the, the, for example, in an emulator, you, want to, you, you don't want the software to know that it's the year 2015. You want it to think that everything is still as it used to be and just the, the weather data is coming in and everything's fine. And yeah, so they're, they're, this is definitely possible. So with, with web archiving, it's already on a pretty high level. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I think uh, access has been an idea that, uh, a common idea among all the presentations. And I think we can all agree that access is a main, the main goal of preservation, right? Uh, otherwise, why are we preserve, preserving things? Uh, still, I've, I have the feeling that there have been some slight differences between your institutions. Maybe in the case of Lima, you talked about uh, researchers. In the case of MoMA, uh, curators and researchers also. And in the case of Rhizome, uh, like a public access, like a, like a wider audience maybe. So I was wondering if you could maybe um, comment briefly on, on the criteria you use in each institution to decide on this. Access to the to the works. Um, I think we now have our own collection. So the distribution collection is uh, is available online, but only in uh, fragments. And uh, as a researcher or a curator, you can get a login and have a have a look at all the works. Um, the more installation works, but also the net art works. Probably you will find just video documentation in, in the online catalog. And we are now at the moment working with uh, some museums in the Netherlands uh, to make uh, a combined online catalog to, to all the media works. But then most of it probably or for sure is video. And then maybe 10% or 15% is uh, more complex uh, digital work. And the rest, uh, we present a lot of works in, uh, in exhibitions and on uh, uh, festivals, of course. Um, yeah, so the position at Tate is, of course, that we're a publicly, uh, you know, a public gallery um, and archive. I mean, I work, for, I work specifically for the archive uh, at Tate um, and we are open to, to anybody. Um, but we also recognize that the majority of our users come from a particular background, um, and that uh, is reflected in, the, in some of the work we do for cataloging, for example, uh, and the ways in which we, we give access. Um, so although we're, we are careful not to exclude any particular audience, uh, we also are uh, aware that a lot of what we, what we put out is aimed at and used by um, a sort of smaller subset of that of that audience. Um, do you want to say about the state in general? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess we, we have a duty to provide access to anyone who wants to access our collection, being a pu public organisation, but also looking at, at, you know, expanding that as much as possible through learning programmes and, 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 and that sort of thing. So we want to, to make sure that they're aware of our collections and our programs. Um, and I guess through digitization projects and the archive too, that that's, that's reaching new audiences as well. 
So, uh, <laughs> at, at MoMA, uh, we're open to any researchers who you know want to come in and view a work. We, you know, it's a regular activity of the curatorial departments to schedule viewings and screenings. Um, previously, we had what we called the media lounge, which was open to the public, and it was basically kiosks where you could come sit and on-demand view. Uh, more or less any single channel video works from the collection uh, on demand. And that doesn't exist anymore, but Stuart Comer, our chief of media and performance art, uh, is currently rethinking you know, what that, how that could exist today. And we're in a very different place because we now have, you know, essentially the whole collection is not yet in the repository, but of the part of it that is, it's behind uh, a RESTful API, which means that access could be provided a number of different ways um, very easily, you know, so they don't have to build like some kind of bespoke app or something like that. You know, it's all behind a programmatic uh, system. Um, so that's more or less what we have going on. Um, yeah, in our case, I, I think I, I mentioned it is that a rhizome is excess, so if there is no excess, then there is no rhizome, because we don't have anything else but this. So of course it's our, it is, it is very dear to us uh, that we can I express also the, the size of, of, the, of, of our collection. Um, so it, it takes precedent above everything to be accessible online. And um, that also means, of course, that everything has to be accessible at the same time online, uh, which, is, which is a bit hard. But also, on the other hand, we understand that uh, researchers, for example, they don't come to Rhizome and look for, to stay with the Lecture example, they don't look for conceptual scroll art, a scroll bar art from 2001, because that, that category is not on anyone's radar. So the um, uh, access goes further by to, to promoting certain forms of online art and to keep them in circulation and in discussion and to highlight certain parts uh, through the course of the different programs. Um, yeah, and that is and that re is is resting on the foundation of the conservation work. I don't know the, if this is an interesting question at all, but um, so it's interesting for me that when uh, almost all the speakers actually um, addressed uh, digital arts in terms of, a, shall we say, like a single creator, while we do have a lot of work that is um, made by multiple crea creators in, in many different forms, uh, including so like artists working with uh, coders and uh, engineers, uh, all the way to sort of like collectively created works on the on the online and things like that. So I was just kind of wondering if you have any thoughts about like general how to address this idea about this these multiple different forms and levels of collect collective creatorship on of of this kind of work. <laughs> um, yeah, Rhizom actually has has lots of works like that in the collection. Uh, one, one prominent might be Nasty Nets, which is a, which was a, a surf club, so where different artists just blogging together and surfing, sur surfing the web and, and highlighting certain things they found or the art they made from the material they found online, and um, this is not this is not very much posing a, a special challenge for conservation very much. This is just like you need to have an an author field in your database that holds more than one uh, item. That's, <laughs> that's basically it. I mean, if you want to go in and ask every artist, so is this the right way how these 500 pages on the blog are that you created are presented here, then of course you will run into problems. But if you don't do that, and this is also something that is very um, kind of normal for, for web-based art that these artists were fully aware that you might look at this page at, at what they made with Internet Explorer in your office 
or you might look at it at home on your um, Apple computer or whatever. So they are very aware about that, so it doesn't create uh, that many problems. It's, it's not, uh, not for Rhizome, at least. Of course, when, when former friends get mortal enemies, then maybe it will be a, become a problem. <laughs> Yeah, this is what I would say as well. Uh, I think it's so default that we forgot to mention it. Um, all the the multiple layers also, but also the many persons, people, artists that work on one artwork or variations of an artwork. And for preservation, it's not an extra challenge. The only extra challenge is if, if they totally disagree how to how to deal with the work. But yeah, sometimes the museum or the, uh, the, the one that collects the work also disagrees with the artist how to preserve the work or how the work has to go in, in, into the future. So there's always this, what shall I say, dialogue, discussion needed and uh, to come to a next step and see uh, what's possible. Tiebe van Tijen won't agree with anything, but uh, he he don't he didn't. Uh, I did some interviews with uh, with him because uh, Jeffrey looked at it and said, "Oh, that's a, that's a good idea. Good luck," and that was it. The support. <laughs> And uh, uh, where Chab uh, was uh, very talkative and uh, uh, told a lot about uh, the work and how to deal with it in the future. But also because that particular work was just one of the manifestations of a, of a whole project. So of course the whole context of that project is uh, documented as well. But for instance, in the, in the case with Peter Struiken, the programmer and Peter and we disagreed in how to continue the long-term uh, preservation. So, and then it's then it's sometimes really tough to to come up with a with a with a good strategy how to deal with that. I think at the core of what you're asking, there's this fascinating distinction that fine art is one of the few creative modes where we maintain this mythology of the singular genius when behind these technical works there are, as you say, teams of people. Um, you know, we don't talk about, uh, you know, all of Jeff Kuhn's assistants, you know, it's like he is the genius. Um, but in conservation, we do work very directly with all of these people. And um, I think that conservators actually get to know these people behind the scenes in a very, very meaningful way because they are often the people that have the most in-depth knowledge of how it actually works. Um, in some cases, the artist isn't technical at all. They just kind of give instructions and off it goes. Um, and you know, as you say, there can be disagreement. And I think especially in artist collectives, uh, there can be very interesting cases where per perhaps there are like posthumous new iterations of a work. Um, so that can be a risk. The artists in the Tate collection that actually work with programmers, so they're not software artists, but they do very often have like credits to their team. So if you'll have somebody like John Gerard, and if you go to his webpage for each work, he has all the collaborators. So actually, that's different from Jeff Koons, I guess. <laughs> lots of interesting questions, lots of interesting answers, but I'm afraid that we have to end the Q&A session here. I would like to thank you all and especially the speakers, but now it's time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>